my name is Hari. I'm the CEO of Property Guru Group, uh, Southeast Asia's largest online property group. And we've been around for a while, so it's interesting uh, following some of these conversations talking about disruption. And the lens I bring to this is that I've spent my entire career in the technology industry. And for the last dozen years or so, I've focused on the digital industry here in Asia. And I thought there were some lessons from it that could be applied to the property industry. I've been part of uh, the Property Guru group for about 18 months now. So I'm a relative newbie. And I thought the greatest value I could add to this group is uh, perhaps the lens of someone who's looked at all these portals and everything else um, as a digital native, right? And I think where I'd probably get started is uh, by looking at what we call our uh, property seekers, the consumer, if you like. And how is the consumer viewing themselves? If you were to ask a consumer who they were, they'd probably start by saying, who am I? I'm the person who expects real-time access to anything that I want at my fingertips because Uber has trained me to think that way. Who am I? I'm the person who expects rich digital experiences because sites like Airbnb have trained me to expect that when I go onto my mobile phone, onto my laptop for a digital experience. I'm getting trained to pay for things using my fingerprint. Thanks to Android Pay, Apple Pay, that's the expectation that consumers are now getting trained to expect when they interact with anything in the digital world. And thanks to platforms like Netflix, they're expecting complete personalization. It's interesting, but about five or six years ago, some of us in the industry were talking about privacy and you know data, and I think there, there, there was a you know there, there are cultural differences. I think in certain parts of the world, it's a big issue. In Asia, it's much less of an issue, um, and I think. Um, What's interesting is as millennials become a larger part of the workforce, they're also bringing their values to the digital space. And one of the things, sweeping generalization, but one of the realizations we had in the digital industry is they didn't actually care about the fact that their data was gone. In fact, they took it for granted that their data was in someone else's hands. But then they sort of transposed this expectation on the provider. They said, you have my data, so don't ask for anything now. I want you to personalize it completely to me. And platforms like Netflix began to deliver on it. And so consumer expectation went with it. Why am I talking about all of this? Because I, as a, as a property seeker, I'm going to bring all those expectations to the property space. So if I see massive dissonance in my experience, in the security that's provided, in the personalization, we have a problem. So it was interesting listening to Marta speak and Mike. And you know, they were talking about the fact that you know, if you think about it from a consumer's perspective, uh, you know, their expectations are different. I completely agree with that. That's going to be the, pretty much what I'm going to talk to you over the next 15 minutes. But I think what's really important to understand is all of us are consumers too. That's the amazing thing about the consumer internet. All of us are consumers too. And yet sometimes when we put our business hat on and start thinking of consumers as someone external to ourselves, we somehow forget that connect. We finish our day in the office, we pull out our phone, call an Uber, look at some ratings for a movie, go buy a movie ticket online, scan our phone at the, at the movie ticket line, and we walk in. And yet when we show up working for online property, we don't bring any of those experiences in or those expectations into our own platforms. And that's where some of that dissonance begins to open up. So I think one of the other things which I, you know, I've, again, I've been following the industry now for a few years, more as a consumer, as someone who's part of the digital space, much more so the last 24 months or so as I started talking to the guys at Property Guru and then came on board. But one of the things I don't see discussed that often in this sector is the ad, uh, one aspect, and that is trust. There's a lot of emphasis put on Airbnb and Uber and some of those other platforms. And we start talking about their glitzy UIs, the fact they're disrupting taxis, they don't have any inventory. Yes, all true. But I think the most interesting thing underpinning all of it is not the UI, it's not the UX. What would possess us to invite someone into our car or share our home keys with someone? I mean, just think back five years ago. Would you even think about doing that? It's insane. Have we not listened to our mothers, never trust strangers? It's insane. We're opening up our door. Come on in. Sit down in my car. I mean, we don't let our friends eat snacks in our car, and now we're letting strangers in. So what's happened? What's happened, and I think this room really needs to internalize it, is trust has got codified. Codified trust is what underpins the digital age today. 
codified trust means that through power of numbers or the fact that we trust the opinions of strangers over any form of advertising or the fact that we believe the community at large is, has better ability to police bad actors than any authority, we believe that the consumer internet gives us the most secure experience we could expect in today's day and age. That's something worth thinking about. Trust has got codified. If you put a certain set of expectations, a certain set of, sorry, e experiences rather, on your platform, you can begin to extend trust, get more information out of consumers, get them to extend further. And this sort of brought me to the whole concept of middlemen. Now, I've had the opportunity of uh, sort of playing a part in digitizing everything from music, from you know pre-iTunes days, uh, all the way through online travel, uh, entertainment. And I thought, you know, some of these spaces had middlemen as well. And let's perhaps take two examples and talk about what happened there. Right? But within the context of this, uh, this conference, obviously. So let's take the first example, the travel agent. Right? Let's talk about the consumer experience when this is what a travel agent looked like. The consumer experience was you show up at the travel agent and pray they're open. God, you know, those lunch breaks were really long. But you pray they're open, you show up over there, you sit like the, the poor guy on the right waiting your turn, reading some brochures, waiting while someone else books their holiday or travel. You finally get your turn, you show up there. You don't get to see what the agent is looking at. You're just looking at their face, they're looking at some magical screen. They're punching away at it as if they're geniuses. At the end of all of that, they spit out something and say, yeah, I know you wanted to go to Greece, but I think France is better for you. Wow, okay, all right. And then you begin to understand that, you know, that airline you want, not really available, but this other one is. And then there's this other hotel. And anyway, the, this long story short, you end up with something, you buy it, you sort of get home, and at some level you're convincing yourself, okay, at least I'm going on a holiday, it's going to be great, it's going to be awesome. You meet your cousin and realize that she paid $1,000 less for the exact same holiday. <laughs> right? I mean, that's the experience. That is literally, I mean, with very slight exaggeration. Well, this is what a travel agent looks like now. Because consumers expect complete control. I want to know hotels, restaurants, things to do. I'll tell you the destination. I'll tell you multiple destinations. I'll look at them all. I'll look at France. I'll look at Greece. I'll look at a few others. I want to know what others think about them. What are the ratings? What are the reviews? I won't pull the trigger until I know what someone thinks about. I was talking to the team at Airbnb, and they said one of the biggest challenges for a host is when they, are the, uh, when they host for the first time. There are no ratings. I don't know how many of you have experienced Airbnb. The first time I did, as a, as a guest, um, I found myself providing embarrassing details about my two kids and my wife and our aspirations for this holiday with a stranger so that they would open up their house because I had no ratings on me as a guest. Right? I mean, this is it's a strange experience in some ways, but I was okay to do it at some level. And ratings and reviews a part of codified trust are standard currency now in pretty much any part of our life. And then finally, payment terms. I want the best deals. In fact, you know what? I'll book now, I'll pay later. I'll get 100% cash back. All of this is standard in online travel, something that I experienced about a decade ago. And not surprisingly, the, the classic travel agent has been completely disintermediated, completely. The second example comes from more recently in my career, and that's a recruiter. Recruiters used to connect people, uh, well, connect job-wanted ads to warm bodies. I don't know about you, but I'm not a warm body, right? I got some skills. I want you to place me in the ideal job. You know what? You don't place me anywhere. I want to look at that company and understand it. The company's got the same expectation. I want to look at that candidate and research them. So today, the recruiter is a digital ninja. They know how to use, well, the good ones are. They know how to use LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Facebook, what have you. They research the hell out of companies. They research the hell out of the candidate. And the very best ones have understood that digital can be an enabler. It can be a power to unlock certain things. Some of the large uh, independent um, uh, headhunters, as we like to call them, actually use digital to lower their cost base. Their biggest cost base is maintaining that damn database. You get a phone call, oh, do you still work at Yahoo? Uh, well, no, that was you know, 2005, but thank you for asking. So I think the point is that that whole experience is gone, right? 
So the recruiter hasn't gone away. Have some of them gone away? Absolutely. Some of them have gone away. If your own, only value was a black book, LinkedIn killed you. If your only value was access to companies, job boards, and others did it to you. But today, there are recruiters who thrive, who know how to use this world. And so the question becomes for the property agent, and the Mike and some of the others stole my thunder, I was sitting at the back cursing you, but I was asking, you know, what, what's going to happen? to a Are they going to go the way of the travel agent or the recruiter? And I think you need to look at some industry truths, obviously, to start things off. Some of these were mentioned, some of these are obvious, but in this context, it's useful. Property is a high consideration purchase. If it's for self-occupation, home is so much more than an asset. There's an emotional connect here. It's hard to be confident. It's super hard to make a property, uh, confident property de decision, despite the effort of all of you in this room and others. And there are large amounts of money involved. So good advice is going to be highly valued for the foreseeable future. And for our markets here in Asia, our belief is that it's going to continue to be a demand for skilled property agents. Now, property guru, we have our own belief on what are those skills that are necessary, and we're going to work on those. But, and I'm happy to talk about it later if necessary. But I think some of the things we're talking about is digital skills, understanding how to do content marketing. These are things which any other sector other than property offers as sort of standard. Right? The great news for us is we can learn by looking at other sectors on what worked and what didn't. Some of them apply to us, some of the things don't. Based on all of this, how are we evolving? Because clearly, as uh, you know, multiple speakers have now said, as the incumbent, as Southeast Asia's largest online property group, disruption is unlikely to come from us. Right? Well, we believe that evolution is also uh, something that you can do. And there are lots of digital examples of this. And so we are very focused on that. We are the largest in the region, including right here in Thailand, the clear market leader for these markets. We have 22 million people who come to our site every month. We have over 50,000 people who pay us money to list on us, or, or developers who work with us. This gives us some people to work with to understand what are the conditions, because our universe is Southeast Asia. That's what we care about. We absolutely come to forums like this to learn from other industries, from other markets. But as speaker after speaker is probably going to share, property is a sector which varies vastly from, in, uh, from market to market. And because we have had this consumer centrism, we are, we are beginning to get these awards, and that's great. But I think what's really interesting for us is uh, thinking about what's going to guide our future. And last year, we sort of re-scripted our mission. And we said, we need to have a clear sense of where's, the, uh, where's north, you know, what's, what's the north star. And for us, it's to help people make confident property de decisions. But how? Through relevant content, actionable insights, and world-class service. And we'll talk about this in a second. But I think the part that I, I want to stress is why a mission is, is useful when it inspires your team and it, it's sort of clear to, to stakeholders you work with, partners and clients. But I think it's also important for a mission to be aspirational. And I truly believe it's aspirational to help people make confident property decisions. Because it is damn difficult to be confident making a property decision of any kind. When we look at our product strategy, these are four elements that I, I thought I'd share with you to give you a sense of how some of those learnings from the technology sector are beginning to influence us. The first one is beautiful products. I talk about great experiences. Um, I sort of, we, we combined a couple of things. We allow developers to advertise on us. Big deal. A lot of portals do that. We have a lot of um, banner advertising, you know, email marketing. Yes, yes, we do all of that. And uh, like a number of portals, we make good money from that. We're not incentivized to disrupt it a whole lot. But I think what's really important to understand here is marketing is becoming content. And that has nothing to do with this sector. That is just a fundamental truth for marketing as a whole. So if you're looking at any other sector, content marketing has moved. It's kind of like big data no longer exists. It's now called data science, because big data started to feel a little old. Like that content marketing is kind of reaching there. Someone's going to come up with a cool term. It won't be me. Uh, but it's time that we started offering those solutions too. And so we offered our first content marketing initiative last year in Singapore. We're taking it across the region. We learned, we made some mistakes. But I think what we focused on was the visual experience for the consumer. So this was in Tanjong Pagar, a neighborhood in, in Singapore. It was for a developer. It was a sold product. But it was very focused on consumers. We are talking about editorial content. We have over 2,000 2, uh, 
uh, new project reviews that we've generated through our editorial team. And we said, okay, that's great, but that's long form content. How do we make this visual? How do we make it such that the mobile experience is good? And so this product called Area Insider focused on that, making it beautiful. And it focused on the consumer experience. And though the advertiser paid for it, the primary customer was the consumer. And that's how it was designed by our product team. The second example was understanding how to use uh, technology. There are a lot of buzzwords. Uh, I think Mata put up one of these words, and so I'm going to borrow that buzzword, Mata. Uh, we use drones. And so in Malaysia, uh, fortunately, it's quite easy to, to send up drones, not so much in Singapore. But uh, we actually filmed neighborhoods. We filmed projects that are underway so that you know exactly what the view is from the 36th floor and the 37th floor and the 38th floor of that particular project. There's no approximations, there's no visualizations, that's a photograph. Right? That technology exists. The consumer doesn't care that we sent up a drone. They care that they get that experience so that they know exactly what they're buying. As many people have said, it is a big purchase. It, I'm, I'm, I'm going to think a lot about it. If you give me a lot of information, it's going to help me that much more confident in that decision. And so we also look at neighborhoods, in this case, Puchong, uh, sort, of a, uh, uh, sort of a neighborhood or a city, rather, that's sort of emerging. We talk about international schools, physical infrastructure. There's a lot of uh, perceptions which can be undone through rich media content. But how you deliver it is also important. It's not just about the video. It's about understanding how, what the consumer is going to expect. Second thing I'd like to talk for a second about is security. And that is the evolution from the world of username and passwords, where most of us sit, to this, biometrics. This is what expectations are going to come. Payment providers are now ex are programming us to think that way. Most of us are beginning to, uh, at our various stages of getting comfortable with this. Banks are doing it. Others are doing it. We uh, facilitate some of the largest transactions, asset transactions, uh, in, in any sector. So the expectation of our security is going to be even higher from us. Finally, I think one thing for us, at least, we believe we're in an online meets offline world. So we don't believe it can be completely online, at least not in our uh, universe, which is Southeast Asia. And so we bought uh, the most prestigious awards platform in this part of the world, which is the Asia Property Awards. And we focus on that. And we invest into it, because we believe that's what developers want. And by the way, that's what consumers want as well. This goes a little bit to that codified trust. I don't know the names of these developers if I'm a consumer. So you've got to tell me what that developer stands for. So it does play a role for the consumer as well. But we're also bringing some of our technology online. We have a product that is focused on uh, called ePropertyTrack, Track, an acquisition we did a couple of years ago that we've taken and it's working like gangbusters with developers. We said, why not put it in a kiosk format, make it available in retail locations so they can cross-promote certain things. But it's not about the customer. Again, it's about the consumer. The consumer can come here. This is in a mall in Singapore. They can go there. They can experience the visualizations, the floor plans. They can even look at real-time inventory availability potentially make a blocking or a booking. That's up to the developer whether they want to make that available, but we're satisfying consumer expectations. VR, like I, I think REA is going to talk about it tomorrow. We invest in VR as well. The one caution I'd give you, it doesn't really matter what any of us do. If the VR handsets don't take off, uh, I read an article in FT last, <laughs> last week. They said one million handsets total, despite the efforts of Facebook, Samsung, Microsoft, all these guys put everything into it and said 2016 is the year of virtual reality. We bought into it. We did a summer of VR in Singapore, and we went, went for it. Fundamental belief I have is that it's not going to work until consumers pick up these devices. So we will continue to invest there, but we're going to be watching that to see whether adoption actually takes off. The final point I'll bring is around user interface. A decade or so ago in this industry, we talked about mobile this, mobile that, make it mobile friendly. Finally, we started talking about mobile responsive. That's true. Mobile is there. And in Southeast Asia, it's, it, sometimes it's not mobile first. It's mobile only in many of our markets. But the reality is the user interface is, is shifting from this to this. right? Siri with uh, her own strange form of humor, that's actually a screenshot from mine, uh, from my phone, um, has the ability to service very targeted requests as long as she can understand my Indian accent. right? Possible. It's possible. Once in a while, she gets it right. But that has evolved, and those creators have come up with Viv. And some of you may have, a show of hands, how many people are aware of uh, Viv? Not enough. I, I would seriously suggest you, when you get a break or something, go look it up. The creators of Siri created this, this product called Viv. What's fascinating about Viv is that's, uh, that AI uh, assistant 
write software as you make requests. So the demo the guy made, the, the, the creator put is, send flowers, my, send my mom's favorite flowers to her on her birthday. No more information provided. He needs to know who's his mother, what's her favorite flowers, when's her birthday, what's her address, how do, where do I order it from, and what payment should I provide. Then, and uh, I'm sure there are a few other things I've forgotten. All of this was not necessary to be provided. The AI wrote its own software. What's that going to do for search experience in, uh, in property? While we are sitting around trying to figure out whether Google or others are figuring things out, Google, I guarantee you, is really, really worried about this and is investing in this space. Because if we start doing this, we don't need search anymore. What does that do to us? Now, Google's DeepMind uh, acquisition in the UK tells us that general AI, so I think Terminator, Skynet, that's still a way out. But uh, yeah, <laughs> they're beginning to talk about that. But, but I think what's interesting here, though, is UI has become AI, and AI is the new UI. And what's that going to do for all of us? Definitely for Property Guru, we're investing like crazy there. Because we do believe, as a market leader, we need to play a role in evolving that. Because guess what? That's where disruption comes from. If the consumer no longer actually deals with conventional search and starts using AI, and we've made no inroads in that space, that is disruption. That scares me more than any other business model change. Because they just suddenly went away. And my main value in the entire ecosystem, those consumers, are gone. So again, I think some of us have mentioned this earlier, and uh, hopefully others will. You don't get to a market leading position with our partnerships. We partner and work with many of you. We hope to continue to do that in the region and across regions. Because I think the reality is as we learn and we do things, um, the, the world is big enough uh, for many of us to thrive in this space. And so I look forward to speaking to many of you uh, over the next few days. Thank you very much.